Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today is July 6, 2020, and I'm speaking with Sadia Ghureshi, who is Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Birmingham in the UK. She works on the history of race and science. Thank you for joining us, Sadia. Thank you so much for the invitation. You've written about exhibits of living foreign people in Britain during the colonial era. Can you describe this phenomenon for us? It's something that's quite shocking to modern ears, but it's something that's incredibly common, especially in the 19th and right through to the middle of the 20th century. So in the 19th century, foreign peoples are effectively imported to perform in galleries, theatres and world fairs as so-called living curiosities. And these shows consist of foreign peoples performing songs, dances, other ceremonies or rites of passage that are said to be representative of the origin of their homeland. So there might be, for instance, marriage ceremonies or even like eating breakfast on stage, those kinds of things. And they're enormously popular. They sell out venues that can seat several thousand people at a time. So those kinds of venues might be places like Exeter Hall. But later in the 19th century, in the context of world fairs, we're also talking about visitor numbers in the tens of thousands and sometimes millions over the course of a few months. You can see, you know, just from those numbers alone, that these are hugely important arenas for encountering ethnic difference and race. But what's really important and distinctive about the 19th century is that it's a period in which you get an expansion of these shows. In earlier periods, you often get an individual or a small group brought over to be exhibited at a local theatre, for instance, or a local fair. And it's there's even a rumour or there's been suggestions made that, for instance, Shakespeare's character of Caliban in The Tempest is based on performances by Native Americans. But within the context of the 19th century, it's not just these small groups. We start getting larger and larger groups. And especially within the context of world fairs, that might mean dozens of people of the same ethnicity exhibited as if they're in so-called native villages. And importantly, lots of different ethnicities so that it's possible to encounter people from all across the globe in a single event. You've talked about these large audiences and World's Fair. What does the history of these exhibits tell us about public understandings of race and human difference? So I think there are several things that exploring the history of the shows can tell us about public understandings of race and racial difference. For me, one of the most important is that there's an enormous market for this kind of show, even in ethnically diverse cities such as London. And for me, there's two big reasons why that might be the case. Even in a place like London, although one might see lots of people of different kinds of ethnicities, that doesn't always mean that you have the option to talk, encounter, greet people. Whereas within the context of a show's venue, those kinds of encounters are not only expected, but they're facilitated. So, for instance, managers sometimes provide translators in order to enable patrons to meet displayed peoples, or they might provide, for instance, a lecture or something like that, contextualising the show's performance. So there's a very, very different kind of setup in terms of information one can gain about race and racial difference at these shows that's really, really important. And one of the main ways that managers persuade patrons to pay for that privilege. Secondly, I think the other really, really important thing is that the shows capitalise on political and imperial timeliness in an important way. So one might encounter many different kinds of African presence in London, for instance, in the 19th century. But, you know, if in the middle of the Anglo-Zulu wars, one wants to be sure of seeing a Zulu, then going to see a show might be the best way to make that happen. And that is exactly what happens in 1853 and 1879, when Zulus are brought and put on show in London at moments when there's imperial activity in their homelands. And it's that combination of both political timeliness and that possibility for encounter that I think attracts people to these shows, but also shows why they're so important and why there's such a kind of interest in them from patrons. If we go beyond these public encounters, what's the relationship between these public exhibits and the scientific study of race? So I think there are several ways that these shows are very, very important for the scientific study of race. It's very easy when we first hear about these shows to think of them as nothing but imperial spectacle. 
or as places that are purely about popular entertainment. But they're actually incredibly important for the making of scientific knowledge in several ways. Firstly, the show's managers are really careful about marketing the shows as of scientific and philosophical significance for anyone who wants to know about race. It's one of the most common promotional claims they make and in reviews, newspaper clippings and things like that. We can often see people trying to work out questions that they have about human difference in relationship to the performances they see. So even for lay people, they're very, very important avenues for thinking about racial difference. But they're also really important for actual scholars, ethnologists, anthropologists who are interested in human variation. So, for instance, in the mid 19th century, before widespread global travel becomes cheap and possible for many scholars, these kinds of shows are actually a really good opportunity to meet and study a wide variety of humans than might be otherwise possible. And in some cases, that interest is actually very, very formalised. It's not just, you know, somebody happening to go to a show. If we think of the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in 1886, it happens in South Kensington, and there are actually members of the Anthropological Society that visit the fair. They conduct experiments on performers, and they're actually given guided tours of the material culture on show, and by that I mean the objects on show. And some of these scholars are actually involved in curating some of those displays, for instance, such as on Africa. So they're heavily involved in using the shows as a kind of experimental space. And we see the products of that in various kinds of ways. For example, as well as using these shows as kind of training grounds, they then publish scientific papers in scientific journals about their experiences of meeting these performers. But they also get really, really fed up because they feel like there's not enough time for them to make the most of the exhibition. So they start calling for a permanent institute, a permanent imperial institute, to actually act in similar kinds of ways. So they're very, very keen on these shows, so much so that they want permanent versions of them. That doesn't necessarily happen in London, but many of those kinds of debates make it clear that scientists and anthropologists see these shows as being absolutely crucial to their research throughout the 19th century. So should we think of these shows in which people who don't encounter different people get access to them? Mm -hmm as a phenomena that began and ended in the 19th century? Or do you see contemporary echoes of the public and scientific history that you've told us about? Well, they certainly don't start in the 19th century. There are earlier versions, but they do carry on into a much bigger scale. And they continue into the 20th century, certainly into the mid 20th century, as part of those colonial world fairs. Um, I think there are ways in which, if we look, that racial difference is still commercialised and displayed for profit in many different ways. So if we wanted, we could find situations where we might say that there are resonances. And some of the best examples I can think of are the ways in which certain kinds of folk shows work. For example, several years ago, I was conducting research in Australia and I was in Sydney. And on one occasion, I took a day trip to the Blue Mountains just at Sydney, which are absolutely stunning. And as part of that day trip, the coach took us to a venue where there were performances by local Aboriginal peoples. And to me, the way that those shows were marketed had deeply problematic and strong resonances of the kinds of histories I've explored in my own research. And I found it deeply uncomfortable. So I tried to speak to the performers and ask them a little bit about what was going on, but they were reluctant to speak to me. But I found the resonances so uncomfortable that I didn't actually want to go in and see the show. I just did some shopping instead. And so I think there are those important kinds of connections. But I don't want to give the impression that such shows are automatically in the same kind of category as what's happening in the 19th century. For instance, in the kinds of shows that I've worked on, it's very, very rare that performers have much of a say in how they're exhibited. It's also unclear, although they often sign contracts, what those contracts might mean, whether that can possibly be considered informed consent or not, for instance. And occasionally, foreign peoples do act as their own managers or managers of other troops, but that's also exceptionally rare. Whereas in these modern shows, there's a much greater possibility that performers are doing things of their own volition in less coercive circumstances and potentially doing this 
as a form of education that they want to commit to. So although they might be residences, I wouldn't want to claim that they were exactly the same. But I think what is important is how much interest there is in these histories and how much better known they're becoming. So although I think it's really important to bear in mind those resonances, I'm much more interested in how contemporary people engage with these kinds of histories and the fact that they're becoming much better known. For instance, I recently learned that Tina Marachetti's novel, The Imaginary Lives of James Pronoke, is going to be made into a film adaptation. And that book is all about James, who's a Maori boy who's exhibited as a living curiosity in Victorian London. And I think that will be a fascinating project, partly because of what it means to adapt that kind of novel, but also because there are many Indigenous performers and advisors interested in the project. And I think that's a really, really interesting example of how these histories remain relevant even if those kinds of performances don't necessarily still continue. Was there any final point you wanted to make? I think for me, one of the most important things about these shows is that they do leave a lasting scientific legacy. I think when people encounter these shows, it's very, very easy to think of them as being horrific, exploitative, and nothing but a kind of public performance. And I think that's entirely true. There are many aspects of these shows that are deeply problematic, that are deeply exploitative, that we need to think about and be aware of. But I don't think they are trivial in any way. And I don't think that they are unimportant or merely spectacle. They do leave lasting legacies in terms of scientific ideas about race. And what's most important that across the 19th century, when we're thinking about this, those debates about race are also about who counts as human. Those debates are also about what the boundaries of humanity is. And for me, that means that the shows don't just play in scientific ideas about race, but about the very nature of humanity itself. Sadia, when we look back at these exhibits of human beings that are shocking and this science that we call racist, how can we assess the development and the status of that science? That's a really good question. And quite a tricky one to answer in some ways because the answer isn't very pleasant. I think one of the most difficult things that this history shows is just how exploitative, coercive and racist science can be. And what I mean by that is that it's very easy to hear this history and think, that that cannot possibly be good science, correct science, or just science full stop. And there is sometimes a tendency to think of this kind of material as pseudoscience. And I understand that urge, I really do. But as historians of science, we need to think very, very carefully about what making those claims means. And what it often means is that we are protecting the idea that science is objective, neutral, and not subject to historical, social, cultural factors. But as historians of science, we can also see that that's exactly true. And that actually science is deeply implicated in imperial rule, colonial exploitation and things like that, precisely because of these ways that sciences and scientists are embedded in these kinds of exploitative practices. So as tricky and as difficult as it is, I think if we start thinking of this as science, as actually an accurate way of thinking about the full range of the ways in which scientific knowledge has been made, I think we get to much fuller and more historically nuanced appreciation of what science has been and how it has exploited various kinds of human beings in the making of our contemporary knowledge. And that's why it's so important that these performers are being used to work out what the very limits of being human means, because that's the very, very nature of racist science itself. And I think that's a much, much more difficult history to accept and learn about. But I think it's much, much more accurate and it gets to the heart of why both these histories and history of science more broadly is such an important way to think about the world.
Great. Thank you very much, Sadia, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation.